Welcome to Beer, Wine, and Shine. Today, we're going to be bulk pasteurizing. Um, I've had these, this is a blueberry mead that I've made before I started my channel. It's done. It's been in the refrigerator cold crashing. Um, to get any amount of sediment that I can out of it. Um, so I'm going to finish this up today. And <clears throat> I wanted to show how I am going to be bulk pasteurizing. You might see some airlock activity here. That's because it's been in the refrigerator and it's now been outside of the refrigerator and there's pressure changes because of that um, it is dry it is not going to ferment no mas anyway so I'm going to be pasteurizing this because I do need to back sweeten this this did sit on the berries for a little while and when I tasted it before I cold crashed it um, it is tannic it has a lot of tannins from them blueberries and back sweetening is going to help balance it it is not very balanced right now so now there's several different ways that you can pasteurize okay there's really no point in taking any higher than 140 145 degrees for about half an hour uh the reason for that I mean, alcohol starts to boil off at 173 degrees which means that's the temperature that you make whiskey at, or at least the process starts, okay? Alcohol as a gas is flammable, possibly even explosive in certain circumstances. Um, and this is a wine, this is a mead. You know, we don't wanna lose that alcohol. 150 degrees and you start uh, some methanols and stuff like that start coming off um, before the alcohol, actual alcohol but it will carry some alcohol with it so there's really no point in going anything over 145 degrees you want to keep it between 140 and 145 degrees now that is not a full pasteurization a full pasteurization is boiling um, or at least 200 degrees for like an hour, um, half hour to an hour. That is a full pasteurization, which kills off any kind of bacteria. That is a sterilization. That is not what we're trying to achieve here. What we're trying to achieve as winemakers is to kill the yeast. Because I'm going to be back sweetening this. I'm going to be adding honey. That's more sugars this yeast can go farther than what it has okay um and you don't want it to ferment but you want that back sweetening to balance the meat out so that's why we're doing it so there's several different ways that you can pasteurize you can pasteurize by bottling going ahead and back sweetening and then bottling each one and then pasteurizing each bottle by putting it in a, in a pot and putting a single layer of bottles all the way around, filling, filling it, the pot then full of water up to um, the base of the, where the, the lid would, you know, you don't want water to go inside your bottles, but um, as, at least as high as the, the wine is inside the neck. And you could heat that um, rapidly or slow. Some people heat it rapidly, like they'll already have their water hot. But I like to, when I do that, I like to put the bottles in and then put hot water or room temperature water in it and then heat it so it all heats at the same temperature, same time. Um, the closed neck of the bottles will keep you from losing alcohol. You can 
just put the whole, like the mead or the wine into a big pot, as long as it's a double bottom pot, because otherwise you'll scorch the bottom and then you just ruin your whole wine. If you do that, you have to put a lid on it. Um, and even then, like that would be an absolute last resort. And really, if you were going to do that, you probably should just use the bottle method because the circumference of the, of the top, right? There's a lot of air to wine surface area, okay? Because your pot may be this big around, right? I'm going to use this bucket as an example. If this was a pot, right? It'd be that big around. That means you have, if you have wine in here, you've got all this surface area that's touching oxygen. Okay, that will ox that that is a risk to oxygenate your your wine. And if you leave it uncovered, you have all that surface area that is going to evaporate alcohol. Even though it's not 170 degrees, it's when it starts getting hot, it's going to start steaming, and there's flavors and alcohol and stuff that's going to be coming off of that. And you just don't want that. The other method is, um, you know, you could put bottles and put a sous vide in there to circulate the water. That helps. Um, now, if you just have a one gallon batch, you can put it in a, in a one gallon jug, just like this and put it in your pot and then fill your water just like just like you would normal bottles but you're doing a whole gallon at a time and you would just heat it slowly um some people may argue with me on that i like to heat it all at the same temperature because glass breaks okay and if you heat it slowly it's kind of like a frog in water right if you put a frog in cold water or hot water he's going to jump out. You put him in cold water and heat the water slowly, he'll cook to death. Okay? Kind of, I just, I just, I just try to take it easy on my glass. Okay? That's why I do it. Um, the, the small neck, I'm not losing alcohol. I'm not oxygenating it. I don't see an issue with it. That's the way I do it. If it's a one gallon. Okay? Now, this is approximately four gallons of mead. I don't want to bottle all of it. First of all, I don't know if I have that many bottles available. And I have several different things I'm going to do with this mead after it's back sweetened. So I don't want to just bottle all of it and then have to pour it out. That's oxygenating. Okay. Now I know this is a long spiel. Probably done lost half my viewers already. If you're still here, kudos to you. And we're just going to go ahead and get on with it now okay now what have i been fidgeting with here this is a little thing here that looks exactly like a heating element like a water heater heating element um except there's no electric it's just hoses or lines here okay i bought this this full disclosure this video is not sponsored at all by any means. I paid for this with my own money. <clears throat> now that we got that out of the way. I bought this from Anvil Brewing. It is called, it, it, it's a cooling system is what it is. What it's designed to do is to go inside of a carboy that's why it's shaped that way it's designed to go inside of a carboy and then you would have cooled water or some other form of cooled gel or something you know the different types of liquid that you can have for cooling and then you would have this pump and a timer that come with it because i bought the whole kit because just this little thing here was two months back order, but they had the whole kit and I bought the whole kit. 
Uh, that way it's for fermentation control is what it's designed for. But it's just, I mean, I was going to make one, but I couldn't find the stainless. It's just stainless tubing bent in a fashion that'll fit in here. Okay, that's all it is. I'm going to use it to pasteurize. I'm going to use it exactly like a heating element. I'm going to pump hot water through this. I'm going to put it down in here. It's I supposed to have a bung that it's a special bung that fits on here, okay? And I'm gonna have it, and then it comes with this tube, okay? So if it's inside the carboy, then you got this tube. This tube holds a temperature probe, okay? I'm just gonna pump hot water through it at 145 degrees. That is gonna heat this whole thing to 145 degrees. It might take a while, okay? But that's okay. I have I have a way I'm gonna do it. Now, full disclaimer, you know, this process is gonna require at least some equipment. For one, it's gonna require this heating element looking thing that's actually a cooling unit. And it's going to require a pump that can pump hot water. So a magnetic drive hot water pump. It's also gonna require at least a pot that can go on your stove with a drain hole in the, you know, a, a brew kettle. It's gonna require, you gotta have a brew kettle, okay? You know, you're gonna have to have at least that. I actually have another way I'm gonna do it We'll get to that in a second. It's gonna be a lot more hands off. If you have a brew kettle that that's the way you're gonna do it, it's gonna be a lot more hands on. You're gonna to have to monitor the temperature of your, um, of your pot with your water so you're not boiling, you're not getting this too hot, yada, yada, yada. I actually have a grandfather, the S40. It is temperature controlled. I can literally dump hot water in it turn it on to 140 degrees, turn it on for like four hours, just set the timer for like four hours. I don't know that it's gonna take that long, but, and literally walk away from it. And I can put a temperature probe in here, in my, in my mead, and my temperature probe has an alarm on it. I can set it for 140 degrees and when it reaches 140 degrees, that's this entire thing, reaches 140 degrees, it will alarm. And then all I gotta do is shut my grandfather off. Leave, the, leave it recirculating, just shut the element off for 30 minutes, okay? So that's how I'm gonna do it. Without further ado, let's get on with it. I got a five gallon carboy here, been sanitized. Um, only reason I split it up here was because I was cold crashing it and I wanted to have, um, I, I, want, I wanted to have the wine, all, the mead all the way up to the neck with as little headspace as possible for oxidization purposes. I don't like that I'm having to siphon so much. It's like the third time. It'll probably be four when it's all said and done, but it is what it is. I'd rather not, I just gotta be careful, you know? Just gotta be careful. So we're gonna go ahead and break this seal. This is a little bit overkill here, but that's okay. This is my big tube. I'm gonna need it for that three gallon. I'm just gonna siphon off these two and we'll be back. It's a beautiful color. Okay, so I just, I hooked up a, a hose here. Now these here don't need clamps. I, they were so tight I couldn't hardly get them on. Um, I need to go get a um, barbed reducer to go from here to here um, 
or to be able to put a new hose on here and go into here. Um, so right now, all I got is I've got it, this hose inside this other hose with a clamp on the, on there. It's not the greatest. That's probably going to leak now. Now, I've got all this set up, right? i got it turned on. I'm going to turn this one on. I hope you can see that. Okay, now this is flashing here at 162. I don't want it at 162. We're going to go 145 degrees. Set. Okay. I'm going to set this for 30 minutes. Set. Okay. Now as soon as that does, gets done flashing, it should be set. Now I should be able to push this button here. See there it says 30 minutes at 145 degrees. So now I just turn the pump on and I got water flow. That's really all I need, you know. Um, I got this in here because it's leaking a little bit. That's fine. It can leak right back into the grandfather. That's cool. Um, and then I got this thing here from Walmart. Okay, I'm just going to drop it down one of them holes and see how it's already going in an angle. I'm just going to drop it down there so far. I'm going to set it at 140. Now, if this is touching the element and goes off too soon, I can insert that sleeve. That's the way I'm going to play this game. Okay, right now the thermal temp is reading 48 degrees, okay, haha <laughs> look at that it's magnetic, I'll just put that right there where I can see it, that should be heating and I mean basically I can walk away from this thing, go do something else. Okay. So in doing this type of pasteurization process, the glass up here is getting pretty hot. Um, and the meat down here is getting pretty hot, but it's cool down here. Okay. It stops getting hot about here. I'm not sure why. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool down here still. Of course, heat rises, so up here it's pretty hot. Um, I, I could plug these holes. Um, I did crank this up to 160 just to try to pump hotter water through to get it to get it to go in a little faster. It is working. Um, I'm just a little bit concerned that this down here is so cold. So if I put the thermostat on the bottom, thermometer on the bottom, it's reading 57 degrees. But if I bring it up to the top here, that's reading 122 degrees. But at the bottom it's only reading 59. Um, that's because there's no, there's no flow. There's, you know, and it's heating from the bottom down. That's a little bit of a problem. Um, you know, when you got it on a stove or something, it's heating from the bottom up and heat rises. So it's a little bit of a little bit of a problem. I mean, this is a learning curve, you know, a little bit. And, you know, possibly what I could have done now that I think about it is hold on you see I have these things it's just a strap it's uh, fermentation control it gets a little warm it, it really it'll it, it'll heat um, heat up to about 70 degrees um, five gallons or so it just keeps it from crash cold crashing it doesn't really get hot you know however I got two of them and if I was doing a four or five gallon batch like I am now, I could have put this on the bottom if I would have thought about it, on the bottom two inches, right? Just put, 
stacked up right next to each other and turned them on. That would have heated the bottom. I mean, it's very slowly, and I don't know if it would actually do any good, but it probably wouldn't have hurt to try. Um, also, a heat plate, or if you had an induction. I've got a glass cooktop. I mean, I'm, I just don't want to put this, I'm just not going to put this on the stove and heat it like that, you know? But, you know, maybe if you got like an induction heater, heat, well, that requires metal, so that wouldn't work because this is glass. Uh, but maybe, so they, they, they do have, they do have some heat pads that probably could have wrapped around it and or a heat pad that you could have put underneath it which i don't have one and heat from the bottom that way now you would still do this but that would just be supplemental heat to keep this from being so cold and this being so hot up here okay so that's what i'm learning and you know probably next time that i decide to do this that's probably what i'll do i'll probably go invest in me in one of those heat pads um just because any heat underneath it this is going to be the primary source of heat for pasteurization but a little bit of heat underneath it would keep it more uniform and would warm the bottom so we're just going to keep going here and so yeah, Learn, we, we just learn things, don't we? This is what it's all about, just learning stuff. Okay, now to solve my problem for now, I got, I put the grain basket in its up position and put this on top of it so that the hot water from below is going to rise up through the screen here and heat the bottom. I, I, want, I thought about just putting it in the hot water. I could have done that from the beginning because this is the grain father and it would hold it. I didn't think about that before. Um, and then just heated the water, you know, and recirculate the water in, from this inside. Um, probably the best way to do it with this, but the water temperature below is 160 degrees and the bottom side of this glass is cold. Um, this is pretty hot, but below is cold. I didn't really think about, I think I was going to run into this kind of a problem, but you know, here we are. So I'm just using the heat from the water to come up. I don't want to dunk it now because I'd really hate to lose all this meat. Not to mention my carboy if it cracks you know what i'm saying so we're just gonna let her circulate there um my water temperature because this is on the bottom it's already jumped up 20 degrees um so it probably won't be too long now i think that's gonna work that'll be a lot better another learning experience this is just one way to do it. Like, I'm using the grain father because I have it. I'm using an all-in-one system because I have it. It's easy. And it's self-temperature regulated. Over there on the stove, you'd have to watch it. But it can be done. So, maybe next time, maybe I'll do that. I'll get a little better at making these videos. I'm not very good at moving the camera around and showing things, you know, I just kind of do it. And it I don't know, I, I feel like I over explain things, but I don't want to just be like, this is what I'm going to do and then kind of just show it. You know, I like to explain things. So, I mean, hopefully that helps people. Um, I, re I really hope so. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to give kind of my final thoughts and what did I learn segment of this video. Um, the bulk pasteurization experiment 
was a success, although it was kind of a failure as well. Um, it was a success as in um, I do think that I got it fully pasteurized. I am still going to be taking caution with these bottles because I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure I did. Um, but not as the way it was intended. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't get there the way I the way I wanted to. Um, I wanted this to be kind of a standalone system where I could just set the carboy on the floor, pump hot water through it through that heating element, and just kind of come back in a couple hours. Just quick, easy. Don't have to don't have to mess with it, kind of thing. And as far as that goes, it really didn't work out very well. It did pasteurize. Um, however, you would have to put like a heat strip or a heat pad underneath it to warm it up from the bottom. Um, I don't know if it's because of the glass or what, but the temperature difference from the top to bottom was significant. Like the top was hot and the bottom was room temperature. Um, you know, that, that that's not ideal. You know, you, you would have to put a heating element or heating pad underneath it or something to warm it. And even then, those heating pads don't get that hot. They're only made to help regulate fermentation temperature. You know, so like those little strips, those little things I had, they will keep a fermentation around 70 degrees if it's too cold. They, they, do, they just get a little warm. They, so I don't even know that that would even work. Um, so really, I mean, the best way is to put that five-gallon carboy, like I would put it inside the grandfather. And then just fill the grandfather up, turn on the recirculation, turn on the burner, and probably have the recirculation going down through the heating element, which would be inside there. And kind of heat it from both sides. Um, or a guy could put it on the stove in just a really big pot. I would still make sure it's a double bottom pot. And I would still put a false false bottom on the bottom. Even if you got to build one out of stainless. Um, because you don't want you don't want your you don't want your your glass sitting right on that burner. You you'll you'll get it too hot. Okay, and you'll get your wine too hot. So, I mean, I, I really had higher hopes, you know, for it, but, you know, it just didn't work out the way I wanted it to, but, you know, I learned stuff and, you know, that's what my channel is about is learning and sharing those experiences, whether they're, they're, they are successes or failures. So that other people can learn from my failures. So, um, kind of there it is. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time on Beer, Wine, and Shine.